Hello, and thank you for joining us for another in the series of COVID workshops presented by Preferred Systems. We, again, want to thank the uh, Erie County Cares Act for Behavioral Health and Substance Use Services for funding these workshops. I hope that you found them helpful so far, and I hope you will continue to join in and, and participate with them. So thank you for being here, and I hope you find this informative and enjoyable. Excuse me while I get this started. Okay. So we're talking tonight about the stressors and the anxiety of being part of, of living through the pandemic. I cannot do this again. Will 2021 be another year like 2020? Well, I think probably not, but I think we need to be ready for at least part of the year being like that. So let's go through and talk about what it's been like and what, how do we can be ready for it. Let's start with some updated basic facts of, of where we are and where we're going. Um, okay. The CDC's current stats on the pandemic as of today um, is there are 15 million total cases worldwide. Um, the deaths in the United States so far are 285,000 deaths. And even just in the last 15 days, it's been 15,000 deaths, just last seven days. If we look at Pennsylvania, we see that in the last, since January 21st, um, there have been 11,542 deaths. In just the last seven days, there have been 979 deaths. Clearly, we're in a spike right now, and it's, it's very disconcerting, and it's something that we all have to take very, very seriously. In Erie County, what we're looking at is, so far we have had 7,400 7, cases altogether with 135 deaths. If we look at who, who makes that up, the 25 to 49 year old age group is only 2%. The 50 to 64 year old age group is 2% of that and 65 and older makes up 96%. So clearly in Erie County, the elderly are most at risk. So if you have a loved one, or if you are an elderly person, someone who falls into that older age group, please, please be careful. Another concern of course is long-term care facilities. 76% of the deaths have occurred in long-term care facilities. So clearly it's very serious situation and one we all need to be aware of and, and and following up on. In Crawford County, the statistics are a little bit better. Um, so far, Crawford County has only had 36 deaths with 2,700 confirmed cases. Clearly that's better than Erie, um, but certainly statistic wise, it's still something to be very, very much concerned about. And then we have Warren County. Again, Warren County to this point has had two deaths, um, but something that we certainly cannot take for granted and we need to be very, very careful with. Okay.
So we looked at those. One of the things we have to keep in mind when we talk about this pandemic is, so what do these deaths mean? I mean, we're talking about a lot of deaths, but where does that rank in American history? Like how serious is this pandemic right now? Well, if we look at the chart of the deadliest days in American ever in American history, the largest number of, of deaths in one day was the Galveston hurricane with 8,000 people perishing on that date. The second deadliest day in American history was during the Civil War, the Battle of Antietam, where 3,600, almost 3,700 soldiers lost their lives that day. Certainly a terrible, terrible thing. The third worst day is the Battle of Gettysburg. Again, we're all very familiar with, with those battles um, and the atrocious amount of lives lost in those battles. Um, the fourth date on this list is the horror of September 11th, the World Trade Center, the Pentagon, um, and even the, the wreck here in Char Shanksville, Pennsylvania. Um, terrible day in American history where 2,900 people lost their lives. The sad fact of the matter is, is that yesterday or today, over 3,000 Americans lost their lives to the coronavirus. And then if you look at five and six on this list, seven and eight, all the way down to the ninth one, um, are all coronavirus COVID-19 death days. We are losing American citizens at an extremely high rate right now. And the problem is it's only expected to get worse. So please, please take this seriously and take precautions. When we talk about a pandemic um, and the concerns and the anxiety and how people are dealing with it, we have some areas that we're really concerned about that we wanna talk about in this workshop. We're concerned about alcohol and drug use consumption. We want to talk about gambling and the increase in gambling. We want to talk about pornography and the increased use of pornography and how that's affecting individuals and families. And we also want to talk about domestic violence. How are these things being affected by the pandemic and what can we do about them? So let's start off by talking about the increase in alcohol and drug use during the pandemic. The chart that you're looking at is one simple day, one single, or, or excuse me, it's a time period from March of 2020 compared to the March of 2019. But look at the significant increases in alcohol consumption in just that time period. And the problem is from the research and, and the studies that are being done now, we know that these numbers have just gotten worse. People are overwhelmingly turning to drugs and alcohol to help them cope with the pandemic. So why do people do that? Well, this, the reasons they've always done it. We know that historically December is a bad month for drug and alcohol use. Um, and so we have, with, with the coronavirus also um, accelerating during this time period, it just really drives up the concern in, in our provider and prevention community of the risk that people are at for suffering from these. Look at the, this chart where uh, not only are people buying more alcohol, but they're buying larger quantities. I mean, the, the biggest increase we see, three liter wine boxes. People are not only just drinking, they're drinking in much, much larger percentages. And it is very, very, very much a concern to us in the prevention and treatment fields. Another area of concern is in gambling. You know, Pennsylvania uh, opened casinos just a few years ago, and there was already a concern about the increase in, in gambling that was going on, the in-person gambling. In 2018, the Supreme Court ruled to open up allowing sports betting. Um, prior to that, it had really only been done behind the, the dark curtain or in Las Vegas. Um, but the Supreme Court ruled that that online betting for sports was allowed. And since that time, gambling has just skyrocketed. Well, it's only gotten worse during the pandemic. Um, you, know, you see some of these headlines that the 
casino revenues were up 13% in October. Um, you know, the, the, as soon as, the, while the casinos were shut down for a while during the, the Pennsylvania shutdown, once they came back online, people went roaring back and it's very much a concern. Gambling like drugs and alcohol is addictive behavior and it's, it's a release that people need to find a better, more proactive way of releasing the tensions and anxiety around coronavirus and around everyday life. Pornography is another area that people turn to, um, especially now that they are stuck indoors. Here are just some st statistics of what normal pornography use is like. 25%, one of every four engine requests, search engine requests are related to sex. 35% of downloads from the internet are pornographic. And these statistics are pre-pandemic. These, these were taken before the pandemic. 40 million Americans say that they visit regularly visit porn sites. 70% of men ages 18 to 24 visit porn sites at least once a month. But you know, porn is not just, um, it's just not just for men. One third of all internet porn users are women. So clearly the men predominantly do it, but women also can become addicted to this as well. One of the sad facts about uh, porn use is that Sunday is the most popular day of the week for viewing porn. Um, the day that's supposed to be set aside and dedicated to religion and the Lord and, and family um, is the most popular day for viewing porn. And even sadder than that, the most popular day of the year is Thanksgiving, the day that we're supposed to be spending with family and friends and celebrating and being thankful for what we have in life is the most popular day of the year for viewing porn. Again, these are, these are statistics that were taken and, and accumulated before the pandemic. Imagine how much worse it has gotten since people are stuck indoors, can't go out, and are left with no means of, of enjoyment or fun other than searching the internet. And we can only imagine and assume what they're doing. So what's the concern with porn? You know, people would say, so what? Porn, no one's harmed by it. Well, that's the problem. And that's the issue that, that we worry about is that viewing pornography can become even more isolating than being stuck at home with a pandemic. If you're in a relationship, it can be very alienating from your spouse. You can be spending time away from your kids, from your obligations. People miss work. Um, like any addictive behavior, it can become a very isolating, insulating uh, activity that takes you away from the things that should be bringing you normal, healthy, happy relationships and enjoyment in life. So we're very concerned about pornography during the pandemic as well. Another concern that people are talking about that they actually feel like there's some pros and some cons is the pandemic's effect on education, um, particularly the kids um, and the school systems and how they're gonna survive. A pro that could come out of this pandemic with, with the combination of online learning, hybrid systems and kids being back and forth. Um, one of the pros is people are expecting that new learning approaches will be developed um, and that these will be tried and tested and then will be utilized going forward. So things that we never thought of before will be at the teacher's um, beck and call, will be available to teachers to use um, to help them become better educators. A con is that there's really concern that distance learning utilizes teaching and learning approaches that we know don't work. The big fear is that we know the kids don't do well when they just sit at a desk and, and hear oral arguments or hear oral discussion or hear, hear oral learning. Kids, especially at the younger ages, need interaction, need activity. And boy, that's hard to do through an online learning. I know our teachers are struggling very hard to figure that out, um, but that's one of the cons, that's one of the concerns of remote learning during this pandemic. Another pro, uh, another positive could come out of this, 
is, and I'm sure you've heard this, teachers and schools are, are getting the recognition and the praise um, that they've deserved for a long time. People are realizing teaching children how to learn, teaching, helping children learn how to learn is really hard to do. And so I think people are walking away with a new, a new and or deeper appreciation for what our teachers do day in and day out. It's, you know, the old uh, knock on teachers is, it's, you know, it's real easy. You get in at eight, you're out by four, um, get your summers off, cushy job. Yeah, now people are starting to realize not so cushy. It's a very, very hard job. Um, one of the cons is that um, the concerns that educators are going to just be overwhelmed and unsupported to do their jobs well, that they're being dumped on, especially as we've moved to the hybrid system where you have some of the kids in front of you, some of the kids are remote. How do you balance that? Um, and are we doing a good enough, good enough job of supporting teachers in figuring out how to do that, that hybrid system, how to, how to be successful in this new learning environment that the pandemic has thrust upon all of us. A pro that comes out of this is teacher collaboration um, will grow and improve learning for all students. Teachers are gonna learn and get even better at what many of them have done well for years. Some of them not as well, not as, have not done as well at, but collaborating, collaborating with one another. Hey, what did you do? How are you doing this? Um, but also collaborating with with parents as well, you know, how, teaching them how to teach their kids, working with them on the kids, understanding what's going on with their kids. So the hope for these distance learning is there's better communication and better collaboration um, within the schools and within the, the school parent community. One of the cons or concerns of distance learning is that if teachers and educators do a poor job of using this technology, it's gonna hurt the chances of this being used later on down the road. Kids are gonna get turned off, parents are gonna get turned off. And so when a new and better product comes along and teachers and schools wanna introduce it, parents and kids are gonna say, no, thank you. We've been there, we've done that, not going back. Um, so there's concern that if, if we do it well, we could have new and exciting new ways of teaching. But if we do it wrong or do it poorly, we may turn off a whole generation to uh, the kind of learning that could be in their future. Uh, a final pro is that this crisis will help us come together across boundaries. Um, this pandemic is not a rich or poor. It's not a black or white. Um, it it's, affects everyone and everything. And so we've got to learn how to talk together, communicate better, um, and figure out how to get through this as a society together. What makes it hard is that some of the schools are not gonna survive, may not survive this. They aren't gonna survive it or they may not survive it. Um, and the concern is, is that gonna increase the, the equity gap? Are the poor schools the ones that are gonna go out of business? And then what's gonna happen to those schools? Are they gonna get crowded into bigger, you know, more kids crowded into a, a school situation? Um, you know, are the, are the, affluent suburbs going to continue to thrive while the inner city is jamming kids in on limited dollars. Those are the concerns. Whether that happens or not is up to us to be actively involved in to figure that out. One of the big things when we talk about, I cannot do this year again, the, the turmoil and the, and the frustration of 2020, clearly has been our political divide that we have been through so much turmoil and, and frustration um, that people often wonder have we lost have we lost or are we losing our country you know what is going on we have a president recent presidential de, uh, election that at this point still has not been completely decided um, on some accounts. Some people would say that it hasn't been decided. Um, it would appear that by all measures that, that, that the candidate, that Joe Biden clearly has won by most measures. Um, but those who support President Trump are adamantly insisting that the selection was stolen and trying to do everything they can to get it back. How in the world are we ever going to get through all this? Um, 
what what's it going to take? How are we going to do it? People say this is this is the most contentious, the the most you know divisive time we've ever had in our American history. Well, I would have to say that I disagree with that. Take for example the Civil War, when our country actually took up arms against our neighbors, against one another. Families and, and neighbors took up arms against one another. Southern states and northern states fought. Uh, over 600,000 Americans died in that war. So, you know, it's, we've lost a lot of people to uh, the pandemic, but we aren't deliberately killing each other over our differences. Um, we may disagree on how best to fight the pandemic, but we're not killing each other because of it. The 1960s, if you're old enough to have lived through the 60s or to remember or have read or watched TV or anything about the 1960s, what a turbulent decade that was between you know, the president of the United States being shot early in that decade in 1961 um, to, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. being shot a few years later, um, Bobby Kennedy, the presumptive Democratic nominee for the president of the United States, killed later and much, much later in that decade. Um, you know, a lot of civil unrest. Then you lay on top of that, the whole women's right movement's going on, you know. So the, so we have the political upheaval of, of the people being assassinated. We have the civil rights movement where the when Dr. Luther King was killed, trying to, to to move the country along in terms of equal opportunity for blacks and whites, um, and having civil discourse that he was murdered in cold blood, and at the same time, women were fighting for their rights and 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 the sexual freedom and workplace and equality and all, all those kinds of things. And then you add on top of that, that we're in the middle of a war, a very contentious war, uh, fighting in a country that most people had a hard time knowing where it even was in the world, in the world, didn't understand why we were there, didn't think we should be there. And yet so many of our young men and women, some women um, were being killed. And, Wow, what a contentious time in American history. You know, we talk about um, the political unrest today and how terrible it is. And, you know, we have, you know, actors and comedians and, and celebrities going on these uh, award shows and, and um, you know, making fun of the president of the United States. And people say, I, I have never seen this country so torn apart. Well, let's not forget that in in 1865, 1865, um, there was an actor by the name of John Wilkes Booth who came from a long line of famous actors of his time who didn't give a speech about the president of the United States. He shot the president of the United States. We don't have that today. We haven't had that today. We, there's no in, expectation that happens today. People mouth off, they talk about the president of the United States, but we don't have that kind of division that we had in, in earlier years. How about um, in the House and the Senate? You know, we have a lot of people who use social media. We have celebrities who use social media. We have politicians that use social media. You know, people going back and forth, saying bad things back and forth. Um, you know, has it ever been any worse than this? Well, yeah. How about preceding the Civil War in 1856? We had a, a member of the House of Representatives, um, Representative Brooks from South Carolina, who took a cane and beat almost to death a senator from Massachusetts, Charles Sumner, because they disagreed on slavery. And, and Brooks felt that Sumner had defamed uh, one of his family members. But he beat him with a cane on the House floor, almost, or the Senate floor, almost to death. We don't have that today. Yeah, so we trade tweets back and forth, you know, and people say, oh, they're mean tweets or they're making fun of each other. Yes, they are. But that's not, it's not the worst that it's ever been in this country. 
the premise that many people say is today we are more partisan, but we're not more divided. You know, we tend to vote, people tend to be less likely to vote across party lines. Democrats tend to vote mostly for Democrats. Republicans tend to vote mostly for Republicans. Independents, relatively small group, tends to float back and forth. Um, so yeah, we're more partisan, but we're not more divided. We're not openly killing our, our neighbors. We're not killing our opponents. Um, and we're not beating each other to death. So I would have to disagree with the premise that this is the most divided our nation has ever been. It might feel that way. And in this 2020 year that we've been through, when everything else seems to be going to hell in a handbasket, so to speak, it can feel that way. But clearly, if you look at history, that's not been the case. Well, what about social arrest? Not only in, in, in 2020 have we had political upheaval um, and we've had you know these mean tweets and things going back and forth, but what about all the social unrest going on in this country? You know, there's protests going on here and there and every which way. And again, it's the worst time we've ever had in this, in this country. Again, I would point you to look and let's take a look at history. Um, you know, periods of social rest in our country. In the 1960s, as I said before, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was shot for being, for just trying to lead peaceful demonstrations against racism to try and achieve racial equality in our country. He was shot. The Black Lives Matter movement started in, in 2013. Um, but again, is it, really a, continuation, an effort to continue the work of Dr. Martin Luther King to recognize racial discrimination, racial profiling, racial, the problems we have with race in our country. You know, Black Lives Matter grew out of the incident in Florida um, when George Zimmer, Zimmerman shot a 17 year old man, Trayvon Martin, um, because he felt that he was, you know, out of place in their development um, and he didn't answer him correctly, he was wearing a hoodie and he, he feared for his life and he shot the young man and he was acquitted for, for defending himself. And that obviously very much enraged people who felt that it was once again, you know, black lives, nobody cared if a black man or black woman was killed, you know. Since that time, I mean, even if you just look at this year, in terms of the incidents that have been going on, um, the Black Lives Matter and Black Lives Matter protests have have talked about and um, you know railed against and tried to bring to the public front. Um, you know, I'm sure you remember in February of, of this year, before the pandemic even began, um, Ahmad Arbery. The 25 year old young man that was jogging in Georgia when a pickup truck with two guys in it um, came up and tried to run him down and then they shot him and filmed it. Um, that was in 2020. Um, Manuel Ellis, he was a 23 year old African American man in March of 20, 2020. He was uh, pulled over by police, apprehended by police, and on the police recording, you can hear him say, I can't breathe. And that has obviously become, if you recognize that, that has become one of the battle cries of the Black Lives Matter movement. I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Um, he was just one of the ones that had said that. Um, Brianna Taylor is another name you might recognize. Um, Brianna also died in March when in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Brianna is an EMT, it was a home in her apartment. There was, uh, you know, the police entered the apartment. They didn't hear them knocking. They entered and, and fired and Brianna was struck, I believe it was six times and killed. And um, almost all the police officers were acquitted um, in that case. Huge, huge, huge case. And that's people are still talking about as part of the Black Lives Matter. And obviously, you know, the biggest, probably the biggest movement um, in 2020 regarding Black Lives Matter was the death of George Floyd. Um, the man from Minneapolis, that uh, police officer um, 
was kneeling on his neck. He told him he couldn't breathe and the man end, ended up dying of asphyxiation um, as a result of that. So, you know, these are all things that, yes, they've happened in 2020, but they didn't start in 2020. These are part of a long movement um, that of what has been going on in our country. But those aren't the only issues that are going on. You know, gun rights and gun control has been an issue in our country for a long time. You know, the, the whole, if you think about the whole school shooting started in Columbine so many years ago, 20, 30 years ago now, um, and has, has gone through to, you know, Lakeland, Florida and, and Sandy Hook, where all those young children, elementary school age children were killed. Um, and the Las Vegas Music Festival, where you know all those people were jammed in, and a guy from the hotel just starts shooting them. You know, these are all things that that didn't necessarily happen in 2020, but those movements have continued into this year. They didn't start in this year. It wasn't didn't happen because of this year. It's it's just one more thing that's going on that we're living through, and we can get through this. The Occupy movement has been around for a long time. Occupy movement, usually with the hashtag, um, is fighting against social and economic in, in, inequities. You know, so there was Occupy Wall Street for a while where people flooded in and, and jammed the streets around Wall Street trying to uh, get notoriety and to disrupt the business there to, to bring it to the attention of the world and the people, um, just how unjust it is. The Occupy movement often talks about we are the one, or we are the 99%, where 1% of the world's rich um, control most of the assets, most of the money of the world and make most of the decisions that affect, affect the rest of the 99% of us um, that don't. And then obviously the climate change, climate change, um, where people are worried about global warming and the effects of, of the climate on our earth. And what are we doing about it? Are we gonna wait too long before we make a change? So in the midst of all these things that I've talked about, the political upheavals, the social unrest, the, you know, all those kinds of things that are going on, a pandemic, how is someone supposed to stay and maintain their recovery in the midst of a pandemic? Well, the first thing I would say is it's important to, because so many of the AA groups me, are not able to meet in person, what I would recommend is that you um, consider going to an online group. Um, So I'm sharing with you here. Um, you can see that if you go to, um, if you just look up aaintergroup.org um, or AA groups online, you can find groups pretty much any day of the week. You click a day of the week that you want, um, and there are a ton of groups to do that. If what you're interested in is an Al-Anon group, you can also look up Al-Anon online groups. And again, you would just, there are groups you can do by telephone. There are groups you can do by electronic media. Um, you can pick what, what type of platform you're more comfortable with. If you, if you want to use Zoom, if you want to use a bulletin board or a chat room, uh, whatever your needs are, there is help available. And I would highly recommend you do that. And again, there are just an incredible amount of resources available for you. Um, if, if that's what you're looking to do. Another important thing about addiction recovery um, during the pandemic, we have to maintain our social distancing. We know the science has told us that that's what's going to help us the most get through this pandemic is if we stay away from each other enough that we don't transmit the virus between each other. But that doesn't mean that you isolate. You still have to stay in contact. So whether it's social media, um, whether it's Zoom meetings, whatever, please, please don't isolate yourself during the pandemic. Learn to do something new. 
you know one of the ways that you fight or that you you maintain your sobriety and fight any urges uh, is to do something new stay active stay busy uh, another important component is to work on healthy living diet watch your diet and i don't mean go on a diet i just mean watch your diet are you eating healthy food are you eating food that promotes health and wellness in your body uh, are you exercising you know we have to do social distancing but social distancing doesn't mean we have to stay indoors necessarily you can go outside and go for a walk you know it's not always freezing freezing cold in our area of the country you know there are days even in the depth of winter where it's fairly nice outside so go for a walk, you know, take a walk in the woods, take a walk on your street, um, do something physical to, to get out and get moving, get your blood flowing. Um, even if you're in your house, there are exercises you can do within your house that, that can help promote wellness and, and keep you moving and really help with your sobriety. And the last thing is just wellness overall, you know, go to get your medical appointments, you know, talk to your doctor. Again, you can do a lot of that remotely through Zoom and tele telemedicine and those kinds of things. Uh, you can do, you know, counseling sessions and, and addiction groups and, and all those things can all take place through telehealth and it can be very, very effective. So please take advantage of those. So, We've made it through, we essentially made it through 2020. And we know from what we've read and what we've heard that 2021 is going to be partially like 2020. You know, this pandemic is not going to end on December 31st. And January 1st, we're going to wake up and we're going to be back to normal. It's going to take a little while. So how are we going to get through that? You know, what are we going to do? How what can we do until the day comes when we can return to normal social living? Well, one thing you can do is you can continue to eat out. And there's multiple benefits to that. One, it's a break from um, you know, eating your own food or the, ha the monotony of having to cook your own meals all the time. Um, but the second thing is it also helps promote the economy of your local area. You know, the restaurants need you to come out to eat. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to go inside to eat. Going out to eat doesn't mean you have to go sit down in a restaurant. So if a restaurant is closed or if they're minimum or, you know, limited capacity, or if you just don't feel comfortable going inside a restaurant, that's fine. You can still support that restaurant and they sure do need your business and sure would appreciate it. So one thing you can do is to, to continue to eat out. Just do it in a safe and healthy way. As I said before, continue to exercise, do something physical, whatever that is. You know, you don't have to go for a run necessarily. A brisk walk is, is, is very good. Um, the other thing you may want to consider doing is getting an animal, getting a pet, get a dog, get a dog and take your dog, dog for a walk. It's good for the dog. It's good for you. Um, but do something, you know, some sit-ups, some push-ups, some, you know, uh, yoga, um, any kind of activity that gets your body moving um, and stretching and, and moving in ways you're not used to doing other than just sitting on the couch. Whatever you do, don't just become a couch potato and just veg out. Um, another idea is to get creative with interactive software, Zoom games, things like that with your family or your friends or whatever you do. Find a way that you can be um, interactive, that you enjoy and is fun to do. So I'm gonna give you an example. This is a game that I know people have done. Um, our family has played it at Thanksgiving, other families have done it. And it's pretty easy to convert to an online format. So let's assume that your family, uh, a group of family is meeting via Zoom um, or Skype or any other technology, FaceTime, whatever you have. Um, so in this family that I'm showing you here, uh, just make sure that I'm on the right screen. Yeah. Um, we have six people. We have mom, dad, we have two girls, Rosie and Jane, and we have two, two boys, Junior and Jack. Uh, and they're going to play this game online. 
So they're all zoomed in. They're, they're, they're using Zoom or Skype or some sort of technology, and they can all see each other. And one person becomes the host for this game. So in, in this scenario, Rosie is going to be the host for our game. So everyone texts Rosie uh, a name. So in this, in this scenario we're using here, uh, the five participants sent, to, sent these names to Rosie. Abraham Lincoln, Bill Gates, Taylor Swift, Jimmy Kimmel, and Big Bird. Now, the object of the game is for, for each, for a family member to try and guess who submitted what name. So as I say here um, in our scenario, so Jane goes first and Jane says, I think Junior is Big Bird. Now, if, if Jane is right and Junior did submit the name Big Bird to the game, at that point, Junior's out. So if your name gets guessed and attached to you, then you're out. If not, then Jane's turn is over and it moves to the next person. So you keep going until all the people have been eliminated. Now, I can tell you from experience that depending on how many people you have, this can get, it can get very hard to remember who the names are. When we play it with our family, we have somewhere between 15 and 20 people. So that's 15 and 20 names you've got to remember. And the host, the, the moderator, the, uh, the game show host, whatever you want to call them, does not, once, once they've read the names at the beginning of the round. Um, so this round would begin with Rosie reading off this, the, the five names. Everybody listens to them, they hear the five names and then they have to remember those five names. Well, if you have 15 people, Rosie's gonna read off 15 names and then you have to remember all 15 names. Um, so by the, a lot of times by the end, it comes down to two people and there's two names that they can't remember who they were. Um, so that's, that's just one example of the ways that you can use technology um, to have fun as a family that you're not just staring at each other and everyone's talking over each other. You can play a fun and a fun game that normally would have been an interactive. Like when we used to play at a Thanksgiving, we'd sit around the table, everyone would write it down on a scrap of paper, fold up the paper and send it to the moderator who would then read off the names um, and you do it that way. So this is a little bit different take on it, but it's a way to have fun as a family. It's a way to do things that you enjoy each other. You can laugh, you can figure out, you know, dad put in Taylor Swift, are you kidding me? <laughs> How did you know Taylor Swift dad? Um, and things like that. So find, the point is find ways to be creative, find ways to have fun as a family. So you're not just doing the same old, same old all the time and everyone has funds and stays connected. And the last thing I say um, to help you get ready to return to normal is find a new hobby. What is something that you've always wanted to do and you've never had a chance to do it? You know, maybe you've always fashioned yourself a photographer. So, you know, dig out an old camera, use your smartphone. You know, nowadays these smartphones are so incredible. They're, they're practically cameras unto themselves but maybe you decide to go out and buy a camera. Um, maybe you um, have an old one laying around or maybe a family member has one from years ago that, that is a pretty good camera. Maybe needs to be cleaned up, whatever. And then you can go out and be creative. You know, take all kinds of pictures, put them on Facebook um, and get some comments. Maybe you want to start quilting. Maybe you want to start sewing. Maybe you want to, um, do some projects around the house that you really enjoy doing. I don't mean like work projects that are like boring. I'm talking like, um, you know, maybe you always wondered if you could build something, um, but find something that's fun to do. You know, maybe even bird watching. There are a lot of birds in, in Erie County and in our surrounding area. Um, in fact, you could combine your hobbies. You could go for a walk at Prescott or, you know, um, any of the, the parks around the areas um, and take a walk and look for birds. Grab your binoculars and see how many different species or types you can find. Um, make it fun. So find something new to do. It, it, and it can even be something as simple indoors as doing puzzles. You know, when's the last time you did a puzzle? Maybe you want to consider, um, you know, starting, starting a puzzle or starting a journal. Um, you know, another thing a lot of people have done recently um, that they enjoy is, 
is doing family genealogy, Ancestry.com or one of those kind of sites. We start looking into the history of your family. Um, who are we? Where are we from? Who are we related to? How far back can you go? You know, those are all fun things to do. And it's also a way of making history come alive. You know, when you start researching your own family and you find out that your great great grandfather was in the Civil War and he was, you know, some of the things I talked about before, he was in the Battle of Antietam. Wow, I wonder what, wonder what that was like. I wonder if I can find out more information, you know, or they were part of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, you know, so you look, it all of a sudden makes those battles, that history, relevant and personal and exciting because you can now mentally place a family member in that battle and history comes alive for you. Uh, so that's just another idea of the kinds of things you can do to help break down the boredom. It's too easy to just say, oh, another month of being stuck in the house. You got to be proactive. You got to look for ways to make things exciting. Um, to find new things to do so that, so that life is exciting for you. So how do you grow and survive in 2021? One good way to start is to set goals for yourself. Okay, 2021 may start off looking a lot like 2020. You're stuck in the house, you, you, you know, maybe working from home, maybe working part-time, uh, maybe a hybrid of working sometimes at home, sometimes at work. But what do you want to accomplish in 2021? When, tw when December 31st, 2021 rolls around, what do you want to look back and say, you know, I got that done. And it may be some of the things I talked about a little bit earlier. You know, maybe you want to say like, I started that hobby and man, I really like that. Or I tried my hand at photography, but yeah, I'm just not an Ansel Adams. You know, it's, it wasn't for me. I just didn't enjoy that. It was, I put too much pressure on myself and the pictures were all blurry and I, I, I just didn't like that. But at least you set a goal, you tried it and you, and you decided you learned something about yourself. Maybe you lose some weight. Maybe you become fit and you end up running in a, in a, uh, you know, road race, uh, 10K race or something um, later in the year when we're all back out <laughs> moving again. Um, but set a, so a goal for yourself, set a work goal. You know, is there a job that you want to try for? Is there, is there an educational level? Is there a certificate or a training or something that, that you've always wanted to, to do that this is the year that you follow through and do it? You know, so set, set some goals for yourself. And that gives you, that makes it a little less owner's task to be stuck inside um, or to be stuck in a pandemic. Along that lines, be in control of your life. Don't just let life happen to you. You're in control. You have to be the proactive one. You have to be the one that, that takes control of your life and, and doesn't just sit back and be passive and, and let life roll you over. That's where people become so depressed and so I and mean, that's not the cause of depression necessarily but it can it can just exacerbate those symptoms if you don't try to take action and, and take control it's important that you are in control of your life another important part is to work on your spiritual life you know i know that we're in the middle of a pandemic i know that 2020 has been a bad year but right now we are in the Advent season. We are, tomorrow starts Hanukkah. You know, it's the season of light. Um, you know, for, for Christians, it's the season of hope and light that each day um, it gets a little darker, but with the expectation that light is coming beyond that. And each day after Christmas, more and more light comes into the world. Um, the Jewish festival Hanukkah, is all about light, that the the, the Jews um, wanted to rededicate the holy synagogue and they only had enough oil to last for one night, um, but the oil lasted for eight nights. The miracle of that, the miracle of light, the miracle of joy, the miracle of the unexpected. Don't let that fade from you, you know? So work on your spiritual life. What, how's that been going for you? And what do you need to do with that, let it be part of the season, um, but also let it be part of your life. 
spend quality time with your family, whatever that means. You know, how do you spend quality time with your family? Do you take your family members for a walk with you? Do you take, do you have quality time with your family by just being alone for a little bit? Like sometimes, especially when we're all in the house together and we're all jammed in, we're all working together, we're all, sometimes you just need some alone time to, to re-energize yourself so that then when you're back with the family, you can enjoy each other more. You can enjoy them more, they can enjoy you more. Um, so don't be afraid to take time for yourself and, and do what you need to do for yourself, but do things as a family play games, you know, like I talked about the name game um, or going for a walk together or, you know, consider getting a pet. Um, consider starting a hobby that two or more of you like to do together. You know, it doesn't have to be a hobby just for you. Maybe it's something that multiple of you, maybe you want to all go on a diet together or you all want to uh, learn how to cook a new food, um, anything like that. Anything you can do together that builds unity within your family so it doesn't seem so such a difficult task to be stuck under the same roof because um, you can do it. And the final thing is take care of your emotional health. Very, very important. Um, just to show you here. This is a web fight site from the um, Center for Disease Control and taking care of your emotional health. Um, so if you just Google CDC um, or Center for Disease Control, but I thought they had some really good points here. Um, you know, a lot of them we've talked about already, but I just want to run these past you. You know, take care of your body. You know, the steps to coping with a disaster or a pandemic, taking care of your body, making sure you eat well, you sleep well. I didn't mention that, but really, really important that you make sure you're getting enough sleep that you're not staying up late watching TV or playing video games or anything like that, um, or you're getting up too early, make sure you get an adequate amount of sleep. I'm not going to put a number on that because everyone's a little bit different. Generally speaking, they say most people need a good seven to eight hours of sleep. Some people need a little bit less. Some people need a little bit more, but get what you need. Make sure you're taking care of your body. Connecting with others. You know, we've talked about that a lot. How do you stay connected, but socially distant? Um, Take breaks. I kind of just talked about that. You know, when you need some time for yourself, it's fine to take some time alone. Stay informed, which is important, but also important is the point right below it. Avoid too much exposure to news. So you want to stay informed. So if, if the pandemic is getting you down and you're thinking this is never going to go away and I just, I don't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Well, there's some great news out there about the a vaccine, you know, and, and originally people worried that it was just being rushed through and it was going to be dangerous and whatever. But the science, you know, if you stay informed, the science scientists and the doctors are pretty optimistic that this vaccine is very safe, uh, will be very safe and will be very effective. Um, so it's important. So you want to, you want to know about that because it helps you stay um, hopeful and stay positive and, and have an optimistic look. On the other hand, you don't want to watch too much news. And I don't care which cable channel you pick, the, the, the Democratic one, you know, the liberal one, the conservative one, the um, in-between ones, whatever. Don't overdose on news. You know, make sure that you, you, you get enough that it's enjoyable to you, but if it's starting to cause you panic or exhaustion or confusion or doubt, then get away from it. Take a break. Go watch something mindless. You know, go watch a Hallmark movie or HGTV or sports or something that, that helps you take your mind off the concerns or the fears of what's going on with the pandemic. Um, so too much news is not a good thing. And the last thing is to seek help with when needed. Very, very important. Um, you know, and I also wanted to point out these, these signs of distress to, to be aware of. You know, feelings of fear, anger, sadness, worry, numbness, or frustration. Changes in your diet, you know, if you notice, you know, any, or energy levels. You know, if you find that you just can't get yourself off the couch, you just don't have any energy at all, you might need some help. You might need to talk to your doctor. You might need to talk to a counselor. Um, you know, that's okay. 
there should be no shame attached to that and saying, I need help. Um, we talked a little bit about difficulties with sleeping um, and obviously any physical pain, symptoms, things like that. Um, and again, the last one they said is where I started. Please, please be aware of increased use of alcohol, tobacco, drugs. Um, last week I was at a conference on psycho the 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 use the overuse of psychostimulants in Pennsylvania. Um, you know we've all heard about the opioid crisis, and it's still very much a part of us. But people now are also overdosing on on stimulants and combination drugs. Um, so we need to be aware of all of it. You know, it's very, very, very much a concern that when we're isolated, we turn to addictive behaviors and we need to be careful that we're not only watching out for ourselves, but for our loved ones as well. So what to avoid in 2021? You want to avoid negativism and pessimism. You have to, as I said earlier, you have to capture the, the joy and the hope of the season, the season of hope, the season of light, the season of, of possibilities. You know, 2021 will get better. There is a vaccine that's starting, already started to be used. You know, they already started um, vaccinating people in the United Kingdom and it will soon be available in the United States. Yeah, it's going to take a while for it to, to get to a large mass of people. So we have to be patient, but there is hope. So don't lose, don't lose faith. Don't lose um, sight of the light at the end of the tunnel. Avoid excesses in food, overeating, eating terrible food, you know, food you just know is bad for you. You know, instead of making a meal, you eat, macaroni and cheese or chips and dip or, you know, stuff that you just know is bad. Instead of drinking enough water, you drink lots of coffee, lots of caffeine, you know, soda pops and those kinds of things. Um, make sure you're getting adequate food. Um, and also excesses in work. You have to have, you have to find joy in life. You have to do pleasurable things. Um, you have to find ways to have fun. And you have to make sure you're not isolating yourself from your family in those things. So don't overwork at the expense of yourself or your family. And the last thing that I, I think I've talked about a lot is social isolation. You have to find ways to stay connected to other people. Um, we are all social people. We need other people. Um, and particularly those that are in recovery. You know, the one thing that that we we teach and preach in, in recovery is being connected and, and what's hard is is we teach the social element the service element of it is you, you need to go out and and serve other people you know the 12th step go out and serve other people take the message to other people well that's hard right now but it can still be done online it can still be done uh, on facebook it can still be done it's just you have to get creative in how you do it um, so i wish you well with that the last thing I'll leave you with is two, two more upcoming workshops in this uh, Preferred Systems um, series of, of workshops to help people through the pandemic. Um, the next one will be on the 12th with Marcus Atkinson. Um, and then there's one also on the 19th with Keith Wallach. So I would encourage you to attend those. Um, I'm sure you'll enjoy them. They're both uh, very excellent at what they do. And uh, I would also remind you that there's a whole series of former workshops. If you, if you haven't been with us all through this whole series, you can go back. If you go to the preferred system, preferred systems.com website and look under COVID, uh, you can find, look at recordings. You can find a whole series that we, of the recordings we've done through this uh, available to you. Um, take advantage of those as well. There's a wide range of topics on there and I think they're all very, very well done. So I appreciate your time. I hope you learned something and I hope this was helpful to you. Uh, Take care and we'll talk to you later. Good night.